Christ is my firm foundation. Oh, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. Oh, I over this place today church let's lift our voice and say that i still got joy in Yeah. 
is more than enough. So I'm trusting God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail.
Come on, aren't you glad you can trust him this morning? Come on, he's a God that we can go to this morning. Come on, it says, I lift my eyes to the hills because that's where my help comes from. How many of you are glad we can go to him today? And he's not a God that ignores us. He's not a God that doesn't care. But we can go to him with confidence, amen? We can go to him and ask. So come on one more time. Come on, lift your hands and say, I sought the Lord. And he, and he heard, heard and he answered. I saw the Lord and he heard. God, we and he seek answered. you today. Come on, lift your Lord, hands up all over this place. Heard, Come on, online answered. this morning. Come on, That's declare that over I your life. Declare that over That's your circumstances today. God, we Lord, seek you this morning. God, we cry out answered. to you today. Yes, Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord. Come on, keep those hands raised this morning. God, we thank you, Lord. Lord, that we come into your presence this morning. God, we thank you. That is because of what Jesus did on the cross. We can come into your throne room, and God, we can present our request to you today. And so, God, we lift our eyes to you this morning. God, past our circumstances. God, past situations of life. God, past, Lord, what we have come in from this week. And God, we thank you, Lord, that not only you hear us, but God, you answer us. And so God, our focus, Lord, we put it on you this morning. God, we put it on you this morning. Come on, just for 45 seconds with your hands raised. Tino, just keep playing. Come on, just, just thank him right now for who he is. God, I thank you that you're a good God. God, we thank you that you hear us this morning. God, you're answering this morning. Lord, thank you for your presence that is here today, God. Come on, give Jesus a big hand clap of praise. Come on, if you're glad of his goodness, if you're glad of his mercy. High five somebody, say, I'm glad that you're here today. Come on, tell them, I'm glad that you're here today. I'm glad that you're here today. Man, so good to see all of you here in this place this morning. I want to welcome our online audience that's already here, and our other locations will be joining us very soon, and you'll be able to welcome them. want to welcome you today. I know I've, I've met some before service, but not everyone did I get to meet. If it's your first time here today, maybe I want to say thanks for coming and being with us. There's a QR code if you would scan that. Just gives you an opportunity to fill out some information. Let us know that you were here. We'll send you an Amazon gift card just as a small token of appreciation. But I'd really love it even more if you would just take a few minutes after service and just stop by our guest services so I can meet you. We have a gift for you as well, and it would just be a great opportunity. Maybe we haven't met yet. Just come by, and I would love the opportunity just to meet you and uh, introduce myself and, and help get you connected here at Heartland. A lot of exciting things are going on Memorial Weekend as we honor those who have went before us and paid the ultimate price of sacrifice. But today is also, you may not have realized it, it's basically a national holiday for another reason. It's Sunshine's birthday today, y'all. Sunshine's birthday today. You want to come stand by me, Sunshine? Now, she said I'm the best brother because I'm drawing attention to her today. Don't tell John. He's right back there. He heard me. Well, I don't know what to say. He heard it. He heard it. Tell him. Let him know it. John's your best friend. No, not John. Me. I'm, I'm the one about to sing. 
Matt's my brother. Yeah, Matt. Matt is the best brother. Thank you very much. No, you just said my brother. You didn't even say best brother. She got me on a technicality. She said Matt's my brother. I see what you're doing, Sunshine. So if you share a birthday with Sunshine, like y'all don't realize that this is the real boss of Heart Lane Christian Center right here. The real boss of Heart Lane Christian Center. For, how old are you today, Sunshine? 47. 47 years old. 47 years old. We're going to sing you happy birthday. What, what key are we in? Hey, there we go. Here we go. Sing with me. Happy birthday to you. Come on, Sunshine. Happy birthday to you. Sing it now. Sunshine, happy birthday to you. There you go, Sunshine. Come on. Happy birthday. 47 years old. She told me we're having lunch after service for her birthday. She said, you got to skip youth group tonight. You can't have youth group. I was like, Sunshine, we got to have youth group tonight, but we're going to go celebrate. And we are having student ministries tonight and, and kids ministry. So if you have a student, you have a kid, bring them back. Uh, weather permitting, we're going to have a bonfire tonight. The weather doesn't uh, work out. We'll figure something else. But we do have student ministries and kid ministries tonight. And uh, and also we've got a couple other exciting things coming up. In just a few weeks on a Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we have our HCC Grow Night. What is our Grow Night? It's a leadership night, leadership development, where every volunteer, kids ministry, youth ministry, welcome team, security team, anyone who makes Heartland what it is, they show up, small group leaders, they're all here. And listen, even if you're not involved in the ministry, you said, I would like to get on a ministry team. This is a great night to come hang out. We actually have a guest speaker who's going to be coming in. We do leadership development. It's a great time just to kind of see behind the scenes all the amazing people that makes Heartland really truly what it is. And so if you're not on a serving team, you're like, man, I would love to get on a serving team. Scan that QR code. You can register. It's free. There's no cost. But it just gives us a head count because uh, what do we like to do? We like to grow our leaders and we like to eat food. So we're going to have food there that night. And, and so come hang out with us. We'd love a chance just to uh, just to be with you and hang out with you and develop you and get you plugged in if you're not plugged in. Also, in just a couple of Sundays, we want to celebrate our students. Students, where are you at? All my teenagers, all my students. They're still asleep. All right. But we celebrate uh, our students on our graduation Sunday. We celebrate our fifth graders that are transitioning into sixth grade because that's a big deal. Most important, we pray for our parents because now they have teenagers. That's the biggest deal. So if, you haven't, if you're not saying amen, it's because you've never raised a teenager. Trust me, you're going to want the prayers when they turn a teenager. Uh, we celebrate the eighth graders uh, that are transitioning and going into ninth grade. But we celebrate our seniors. It's a big deal when they graduate. So if you're a senior and you're graduating, make sure you scan that QR code. Carter, scan that QR code. Noah, scan that QR code because we want to celebrate you, and, and we're going to give you a gift that Sunday, and we want to honor you. Anyone else is a senior, and, uh, and we want to just honor you that Sunday. It'll be a great uh, weekend for our students. How many of you know it's good to celebrate students? Amen? I'm glad you're at a church. You don't realize that you're at a church that believes in the next generation, and so we, we want to honor them on that Sunday. Hey, I want you to stand with me this morning as we get ready to honor God in our tithe and offering. Yeah, I see you, Noah. I see you, Carter. Scan that QR code. Did they take it off? Put it back on the screen. They was trying to scan it real quick. Then we'll go to offering. There we go. Scan it now. Hurry quickly. Um, but as we get ready for offering, if you've got uh, check or cash, you can grab an envelope, or maybe if you're giving digitally. Uh, you can grab the uh, I Gave card. That's how my wife and I, we love to give is through the app. I just want to thank you for your stewardship today. Today is also Missions Sunday. And so beyond your tithe, if you want to give an offering to missions, it is greatly appreciated. We have a great things that we're able to accomplish because of your giving. Matter of fact, if you've been watching the news right so over the past several weeks, some of the terrible tornadoes that have hit some places uh, in our country, and then even if you've been keeping up, it hasn't got a lot of a lot of attention. But the flooding that's been taken uh, that's been taking place in Brazil, uh, we have people already on the ground. Convoy of Hope that we partner with, supplies are there as soon as disaster strikes, and it's because of your giving that I want to thank you that we're able to do that this morning. In 1 Chron Chronicles chapter 29, I want to read you a, a few scriptures this morning. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, and, and the section is called David's Prayer. And David is, is, is saying this prayer aloud in, in, in front of his people. And, and, and he's praising God in front of the whole nation. 
And this is what he writes in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11. David says this. He says, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything. Come on, say everything. Everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our, now our God, we give thanks. This is now David's response. And I want to pray this over us. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? They've been so blessed. He goes, I don't even know how this has happened that I'm able to give so generously. Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. I don't know about you, but how many of you know without God, I wouldn't have anything? Come on, say amen to that. Everything that I have comes from him, his blessings, not just financial, but emotional, relational, spiritual, uh, mental blessings. They, they all come from God, and when we give, that's what we're doing. We're just simply returning back to him what's already his. Because without him, I would have anything. Without him, I would be nothing. But because of his grace and mercy, come on, I'm blessed this morning. Someone, if you're thankful for God's blessings, I want you to grab your offering in your hand. And I want to pray a blessing over you. God, thank you, Lord, today for men and women all across this room. God, at every location. God, those online this morning that, are, God, we're giving today. God, we're sowing into your kingdom. And God, we're just returning what's already yours. God, thank you that we're a blessed people. God, not just financially, but God, in all areas of life. And so, God, because of your blessings, God, we're able to be generous back. And God, I know in this room, too, Lord, that there's miracles that need to happen. There's miracles that need to take place. And God, I pray that you would prove yourself true, your word true, that as we honor you and as we steward you and as we trust you, that's what giving is about. It's about trusting you, God, that you would open the windows of heaven over our life, that you would bless us in ways that we could not even comprehend. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And amen. Come on, would you honor and worship God in offering as I sing one more song before Pastor comes? Oh 
one more time. Let's just declare this. Come on, say by stripes. By your stripes, I am healed. With one touch, I am made whole. You have spoken, and I know that it is so. Come on, say in the storm. In the storm, you are peace, and your love won't let me go. You have spoken, and I know that it is so. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, give the Lord a praise. Would you do that? Come on, tell him. Hey, look at your neighbor and say, wouldn't it be great if we would just believe what God says about us? Come on. Tell them that. Hey, wouldn't it be great if we just believe what God says about us today? Hey, we want to welcome you. So glad that you are with us on Memorial Day weekend. We don't take it lightly that you are the saved ones. You decide to come to church. Hello? You didn't forget about God because it's Memorial Day. The greatest sacrifice that was ever made was Jesus Christ on the cross over 2,000 years ago. Come on. I mean, that's the greatest sacrifice. We don't belittle all the other men and women's lives. Absolutely, man. We take a few minutes to honor them. Uh, hopefully this weekend is more than just a three-day weekend for you. And, uh, you know, all this month we've been in a series just talking about being rooted. It's important as the staff and I and the leadership team, we're praying for our church right now. We're praying for the vision, the mission of our church, and ultimately everything we do has to stay rooted in a solid biblical foundation. Amen? Come on. We talked about being rooted in hearing and listening to the Word of God. Uh, uh, Pastor John did an amazing job talking about that. Pastor Matthew talking about rooted in obedience. Not just being hearers of the Word, but being doers of the Word, right? Come on. Last week, we talked about being rooted in the love of God. And today, I want to talk about being rooted in our identity in Christ Jesus. Amen. Rooted in our identity in Christ Jesus. Wadita, North Judson, Hebron, Westville, NPH, everybody online. Come on, would you give them a good welcome this morning now? They are with us. And we're excited about that. How many, how many appreciates your, your physical identity, your name? How many appreciates your name? You, how many knows where your name come from? Do you, do you have the history of that? You know, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm privileged. My mom's been up here for the last 21 days and 14 hours. And no, not that we're counted. You know, I don't think we're counted. Every moment is precious. But no, I appreciate my mom. She's been here. But, but I, I, I found out as I got older, I, I was named by my aunt. I had an aunt by the name of Libby. It was her older sister. She named me Philip Dale. Now, now Philip, I, I learned earlier in life, it means lover of horses. And I'm, it, it fits. I, I've always loved horses. I grew up dreaming about horses. I'd see a horse, and I would just think about a horse. I mean, I found out somebody after church, they said, you know, they, I didn't know where Dale come from. Dale means valley. It means, uh, usually it means huge valley. So, Philip, lover of horses, valley. And, uh, you know, and I appreciate the, the language that you get. It's amazing for some of you parents that haven't had your babies born yet, it's amazing how names can stick to your kids and they have substance behind it. Come on. We've we got to get over from just dropping silverware and whatever noise they make. That's what we name our kids. Hello. Whatever. You know, it's just like it's important of our identity. And uh, what, what I want to look about to this morning is how we can get rooted in our identity in Christ. I don't know about you, but I, I know in our culture right now, they're, they're very interested in this journey of discovering individual identities. I mean, there's all kind of personal uh, personality tests out there. How many's ever taken a personality test? You know, you know, how many's ever, come on. We need to give a personality test. I'm a lion. If you didn't know, I'm a lion. Hello, type A personality. Duh, I'm coming out of my shell today. 
But, but there's all kinds of personality tests out there. there there's dream assessments that you can even take. And, and uh, it, it seems like we have a culture today that, that, is, that is searching for something to tell them who they are, where they belong, and, and how they are supposed to be relating to this world. We have an entire culture that is struggling with their identity. And I'm not, this is not a politically incorrect message today I'm going to talk about because I want to talk about our identity in Jesus Christ. But a man typically identifies himself by what he does. You ask the man who you are, and they will say, well, I'm a truck driver, I'm a, I'm a carpenter, I'm an engineer, uh, you know, I do this, I do that. You ask the woman about herself, and she immediately goes through her relationship. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. Then they dig down. I'm a mother of three kids. I'm a mother of two kids. I have five teenagers. I have three boys. You ever see moms, how they very descriptive? about their identity. It's tied to relationships. In both men and women, we use, we use physical attributes, we use heritage, we use possessions, backgrounds, all of those things, over time, they become our identity. They become who we are, and we live our lives out of that. So this morning, what I want to talk to you about, what I think the most single, most valuable, yet it's the least understood treasure is our identity in Christ. It's, it's who we are according to Christ. Listen, what, what I know, what I know to be truth in my life and in your life, until your identity in Christ becomes the, the prominent, the way that you think, it, it's impossible for you to truly be rooted in the foundation where nothing moves you and nothing sways you, you stay focused on Jesus Christ and living out your life for Him. Amen? Now, now most of us in this room know that, that we're all created in the image of God. The Bible says that. Listen, we're not time plus slime, okay? Come on, God created us. The Bible says, in His likeness and His image. Well, what does that mean? Well, the spiritual context of that is that God is a spiritual being. In other words, that your spirit is the immortal part of you. Your spirit's going to outlast your body. Guess what? These bodies are one day going to be retired. True? Come on. They're going to die. So, so we're like God in that we're spiritual, but we're also like God in that we're intellectual. God gives us the ability to think, to reason, to solve problems. We are relational. God designed us to be able to give love and receive love. And then lastly, we have a moral conscience. To be made in the image of God simply means that we have the ability to be able to discern what is right or what is wrong. Listen, how many, how many would agree today that we need more moral consciousness being going on in our world today right now? I mean, we've lost our moral conscience. We, we just simply lost the ability just to know what's right or to know what's wrong, to do the right thing and to follow the right path. But we're created in the image, in the likeness of God. So our identity should be wrapped up in Him. I want you to look at Jeremiah 17. This is the verse. I used it last week. I want to read it because I think there's some important truths here concerning our identity. He says this. He said, blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and their confidence. Notice what he said. Everything that we have, we trust in him. We've made the Lord our hope and our confidence. What happens to that person? What's the result of the person's life? He said, you'll be like trees planted on a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried about long months of droughts. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Now listen, did you notice? He didn't say we wouldn't have any heat. He, he didn't say we wouldn't have things that where it seems like there's been long months of drought. Anybody ever had a spiritual drought in your life where it just seemed like things wasn't happening? 
the way you want to see them. Am I preaching to anybody today? Anybody ever had those moments where it seemed like you were praying and wasn't nothing happening? We used to have a phrase when I grew up in the South and, and, and my mom and dad, you know, raised me in church. We used to have a phrase that you've got to stay in the altar till you pray through. You ever, ever heard of the word pray through, the phrase pray? You know what that meant? It just simply meant that you stayed there and you refused to let go of, the, of what they, they used to say, the horns of the altar. When I was a kid, I'm thinking, I don't see no horns nowhere. You know, I'm just, grab a hold of the horns of the altar and pray through. Well, what I discovered as I got older, what that simply meant was that there were times where it seemed like you're in a drought. There are times where it seemed like something wasn't happening. It was, you wasn't getting the breakthrough. Things wasn't going. But listen, what the Jeremiah said, when you put your trust in the Lord, you put your hope in Him, you have confidence. You don't worry about the drought. You don't worry about the heat. Why? Your leaves are going to stay green, and they never stop producing fruit. Listen, what, what drives me, where is my focus, is going to ultimately determine what kind of success I have in life. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with the accolades of other people. How many, how many loves the accolades of people? I mean, how many would agree somebody saying you did a good job feels good? Come on. You're not going to confess to nothing. That's okay. I just, I don't know. It, it feels good. I, I, love, I love the accolades of people. I love it when people say, hey, Pastor Phil, Great message, really challenged me. You've given me some things I need to go home and pray about, and I, I think God speaks. I, I love it. Accolades are okay. Listen, having, having relationships around us that, that, that builds us up. Listen, there's nothing wrong with that. Having a, having a successful career, there's nothing wrong with that. But here's the problem. The problem becomes when those accolades, when, when those relationships, when that career, uh, you know, that, that you put you on, know, when, when those things get stripped away from you, you feel like a failure. When, when you lose those, those, those praises of people, when somehow or another you don't get the promotion, when somehow or another despite everything that you do, your relationship falters, you feel like a failure. Satan loves to put us in the failure zone. He loves to, for us to be building our lives on something other than our identity in Jesus Christ. Listen, you, you do understand Satan cannot create anything. You understand that, right? He's not a creator. The only thing that Satan can do is that he perverts or he distorts or ultimately destroys what God has created. That's all he can do. He's a perverter. He's a destroyer. He, he is one that absolutely distorts the things of God. That's the reason why the accolades, the career, none of that stuff is wrong unless you build your life on that. Okay? God's not against us having stuff. He just don't want stuff to have us. God's not against us having people in our lives that pat us on the back. But if your decisions in life are determined whether or not you're making people happy or God happy, you're going to get in trouble. And what Satan does, he perverts what God gives us. He, he either distorts it or destroys it. And listen, what I have to be careful with, me... I'm a lion. I'm a type A personality. I have to be careful that what, what I do never overshadows who I've been called to be. My doing can never get more important to me than my being. Remember last week I said victory has a voice, right? Come on. Victory, anybody, anybody been, been, been uh, you know, like an impala this week? You've been, I don't have jumps today. I had them last week as an anointing of God. I had so many teams calling me last week wanting me to play basketball for them because they saw me jump. Wishful thinking. But, but what, what, what happens is, listen, I, I talked about the vic, that, that victory has a voice. But let me tell you also, victimhood has a voice. 
the, the, the idea and the thought that Satan, listen, will, will, will challenge us. And what we have to make sure is that we change the narrative. If I can change the narrative from victimhood to victor, then I can change the outcome in my life. Come on, somebody. And what you have to understand is that our identity has to stay wrapped up in Jesus Christ because if it's anything else, we're going to find ourselves in trouble. Now, what's this? Let me, let me walk you through some stuff. Here's what we know about Satan's ability to distort, to pervert, and ultimately destroy is that sin has done a number on our bodies. Have you ever noticed that? Listen, God's original plan for our bodies was that they would perpetually renew themselves. Death, the reason why death is so uncomfortable, it's not normal. Death was never part of God's original plan. Death came in when sin came in, right? Come on. And sin has done a normal, has done a number on our bodies. Sin has changed the reality for so many people. Listen, I, I didn't put this I didn't put this in your notes, but I, it's in mine. I just want to read, write down Romans 3, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 and 16. Now, we know Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? Come on. There's none righteous in this place. We've all sinned. But I want you to know, sin has done a number on my body. But you know where the number one place sin has affected our bodies? L listen to Romans 3 and 10. He said, no one person has God's approval. No one understands. No one searches for God. Everyone is turned away. Together, they have become rotten to the core. No one does anything good, not even one person. Now listen, Paul is describing what man is like apart from God. None of us. Are good. He says, now what's it? He said their throats are open graves. Their tongues are practice deception. Their lips hide the venom of poisonous snakes. Their mouths are full of curses and bitter resentment. They run quickly. He finally moves away from this to this. They run quickly to murder people, and there, there is ruin and suffering wherever they go. Now listen, here's the problem. We, we normally think in terms of sin, as adultery, abortion, murder, or drugs, abuse, or stealing, or killing. But listen, Paul brings it right down to where we live. He said the greatest sin, the most frequent sins, are sins of the tongue. Did you get it? Four things Paul mentioned have to do. He mentioned tongue. He mentioned lips. He mentioned mouth. He mentions throat. Listen, it appears the most sinning thing that we do is with our mouths. Now, isn't that interesting? Proverbs says, by your words you are justified. By your words you are condemned. Now, you're in a spirit-filled church. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe that God gives us ability to speak in a heavenly language. And I know we've got people that you're afraid of the spiritual tongue. I got news for you. We have more problem with the natural tongue than we do the spiritual tongue. Some of you need to speak in tongues. Because your natural language is not very good sometimes. And listen... The, the most spiritual infected part of the body comes out through our mouths more often than anywhere else. Yeah, sin has done a number on our bodies. And we see it by our verbiage. That's the reason why we try to work hard at Heartland. I know some of you get frustrated sometimes because we're so popular. Listen, I'm tired of hearing some of you proclaim victimhood all the time. Yeah, I know you've got problems. Yes, you've been brought out of some horrible thing, but stop living in the past and live where God has wanted to take you, and that is to your future. <laughs> proclaim victory, not defeat. Well, sin has done a number on us psychologically. I mean, psychologically, sin has messed up our perception on reality today. It's caused many people to play games with their lives. Many people live in a 
fantasy world today. And it's, listen, it's all because of sin. Listen, I understand depression. Depression is a real thing. Listen, sometimes depression can be the result of a chemical imbalance in the brain. Sometimes it's caused from a brain tumor even. You understand that study has been made that the second most cause of depression is guilt. Everybody say guilt. Guilt, which which often is a result of a person feeling like what they've done is unforgivable. Where do you think that comes from? You think it comes from God? Or you think it comes from the perverter Satan himself? He wants you to feel condemned. He wants you to feel guilty. He wants you to feel overcome. He wants you to feel like, man, there's no way out. I'll ever get better. He wants to put you in that place of depression. But I'm here to submit to you that we have an overcomer. And Jesus Christ can lead us out of that triumph and let us be victorious, even over the psychological messed up mind. Sin has done a number on our bodies. It's done a number on our psyches. But thirdly, we know sin has done a number number on us spiritually. You know what? You know what? uh, This this is just my perception. You know what? The worst sin I think Satan has done on us spiritually is that because of his perversion, distortion, and destruction. He is successful in keeping us from hearing the voice of God speak today. God is speaking today. Folks, God hasn't died. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about some weird feeling where where you get up and, you know, God told me this. You know, I hate it when somebody uses the God card on everything. What do you do when they say, God told me? God told me. Well, what do you do with that? You know, I, I try to be careful with, with vision with, that we share here. I, I try to help us navigate, hey, this is what I feel in my heart. This is what I sense God's saying to us. But, uh, but listen, it may be me. If it's me, that, that, then it'll, it'll fail. It won't, it won't go through. If it's God, we're going to succeed. Are you following me? Most all the vision that you see happen at this church, all of our campuses that's been planted happened because I simply had a sense or a feeling that I think this might be God. I think God might be telling us to go to North Chesson and do something down there where there's no hope. I think God might be speaking to us about what I, I, I think he's telling us to do a biker church. But listen, the only way to tell whether or not that's truly God is to step out and do it. Sin has done a number on our ability to hear God speak to us. Listen to the voice of the Lord. And sometimes it's not the thunder. We hear it. It's not the lightning. Remember Elijah? Still small voice. A whisper. A whisper. And sometimes that's what I, I wish I could, I wish I could tell you. God yelled at me about starting this. No. I feel a whisper. I feel a whisper about the Sunshine Center. I feel a whisper about the biker ministry. I feel a whisper. And listen, what what, what I want to make sure that we stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Listen, because we, we don't hear God speak the way He is speaking today. It leaves us wandering without adequate direction and care in our life. Write this down. Wholeness is the process that begins with God. Say that with me. Wholeness is the process that begins with God. We're all broken people. We're all sinful people to start with. God redeems us. He, 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 he pulls us out of that sin. He replaces the sin in us and gives us his righteousness. But listen, the whole process of being simply whole is, is something that starts with God. That's, that's, that's the reason why he has to be our foundation There's too many people today that you and I rub shoulder with that have this constant feeling of dissatisfaction. Have you ever met, have you ever been in a generation that has more dissatisfaction than our culture? People just can't get any satisfaction. 
I don't care what it is and, and, and what career they have, the amount of money they're making or what car they drive, that there's always this unrest going on, that this sense of detachment. There's never been a culture like ours right now that has the ability just to unplug so quickly without thinking about the consequences of that decision. We see people unplugging from marriages just like that. Hello? Just, what? What? I mean, I just saw this couple a few months ago. They've been married 15 years. Just unplug. Parents just unplug from kids. I've never seen it like a generation. Kids just unplug from parents. She's dead to me. He's dead to me. What is that? Is that, that sense of detachment. This happening in our culture today because we've lost our identity in Christ Jesus. The, 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 the sense of just constantly having this destination sickness. Boy, that's a disease, isn't it? Destination sickness. I could, if I could just get here, if I could just have her, if I could just have him, if I could live in that house, if I could live, have that career, if I could make that money, if I could drive this car, if I could, this sense of destination Sickness, thinking, if I just get there, I'll be happy. Guess what? Wherever you are, there you are. Wherever you go, there you are. Hello? Well, good preaching, but maybe North Johnson and Wanita and Hebron's really enjoying this today. I don't know. I love this church, and I, I love the fact that we got men and women in this church that we understand that wholeness is, is this process that just, that just begins with God and that is, we, we, we continually surrender our lives to Him, allow Him to work in us, that God has a tremendous plan for us. Listen, listen to this statement. I want to tell you this statement. It's not in your notes, but listen to it. Listen, I believe that God wants us powerfully favored, supernaturally gifted, and abundantly successful. Come on, say that with me. I, I know I'll give you three. So I believe God wants us powerfully favored. Say, I'm powerfully favored. I'm supernaturally gifted. And I'm abundantly successful. Listen, I won't back down from that. I believe God wants us living that kind of a life. I believe he wants us living in this world today in spite of what the world says it's going against Christianity. I believe that we can stand up just like the early church. The Bible said they had favor with God and they had favor with man. And the church grew supernaturally gifted. I believe that in this last day, the Holy Spirit's going to raise up some supernatural gifts. I'm just, talk, I'm, I'm just talking about spiritual gifts. I'm talking about leadership gifts, serving gifts, that we do it supernaturally. Somebody asked me yesterday, now listen, this is just me, not, not bragging on me. We've got so many guys that help us do what we do when it comes to the biker ministry. But yesterday, I had, I had five or six guys. We had over 200 miles on a, on a motorcycle, over eight hours on our feet, serving a community, loving on bikers, loving on veterans. And listen, people say, how do you do that? Somebody asked me yesterday, how do you do that? Let me tell you, supernaturally gifted. It's like Jesus. You look at the field and you see how white they are. They are the harvest out there and supernaturally powered. We step into this broken world and they say, we got some good news for you. Come on, somebody. Powerfully favored, supernaturally gifted, abundantly successful. So how do, how do, we, how do we get there? How do, we, how do we establish ourselves where we live that way? So write this down. There's four areas I want us to just get real quickly. I've got, I've got about 20 minutes or so. I'm going to try to hurry. Listen, number one, our identity in Christ is something that we receive, not achieve. Listen, it's important. We, we emphasize, listen, Christ followers, Christians, we're not just people trying to do better. Listen, this church isn't just trying to help you turn over a new leaf. It's not about doing better. Listen, the Christ life is about a new identity. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, we are a new creation. Come on, a new creation has come. 
140 times in the New Testament, that phrase, if anyone is in Christ, in Christ, everybody say, in Christ. You'll never find your true identity horizontally. Okay? You'll never find it here, here, here. The only way you're going to find your true identity is vertically, is understanding, listen, that you are who you are, not because of what you do, but because who Christ says that you are. I am somebody in Christ, listen, not because the world says it, but because God's Word says it. Because the world says, hey, if you perform, if you achieve, then you can gain status with us. Come on. The world says you become somebody when you perform some great deed or you get some great status. So what do we do? We work at it. We want that career. We want that raise. We want that status. We want that house. We want that car. We want that motorcycle. We want all of that. Why? Trying to, trying to live up to the images that the world has said, man, you're a success. God says, nope. It says, my love for you, your identity, listen, can never be based on your performance or your personal achievement. It always comes back to how you are connected to Jesus Christ. He invites us to this partnership with him. I love that. He said, come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Everybody just come to Jesus. Come on. Some of, some of us every morning, you need to get up and have a come to Jesus moment. Hey, Jesus, I'm coming to you. My identity is wrapped up in you, not in what I do or what I don't do today. I'm going to go out and give it my best. I'm going to work hard. I'm going I'm to be the best employee. But listen, my identity is not tied up in any of those things. I love what Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In verse 3, he says, I care very little if I am judged by you or any human court. <laughs> Whoa, wouldn't that be a great place to get? He said, indeed, I don't even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. I love that. Paul said with confidence, not with alarm. Paul, Paul wasn't scared of God judging him. He says with confidence, God judges me. God's the one that's looking at what I'm doing. Are not doing. God's the measuring stick I'm trying to, is, is that making sense to anybody? What a relief it will come in your life if you let God be your judge. Furthermore, Paul will say, God identified us at his own by what? By placing the Holy Spirit in the heart. He, he bought us with the blood of his son. Listen, we can claim our identity and our righteousness in Jesus Christ. Not because we've earned it, but because we just simply receive it. Isn't that amazing? How much more relaxing life can you live? If you walk around and say, hey, I love you, dude, but I'm not worried about you judging me. I, I, God judges me. I live my life for the audience of one. Woo, that's good preaching right there. Here's the second thing. Our identity in Christ causes us to live for God and not for ourselves. Oh, that's a switch, isn't it? To get wrapped up in being having your identity so wrapped up in God that now you're living for him, not for yourself. He says this in 2 Corinthians 5, and he died for all that those who should live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And then Galatians 2 and 20, he said, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ just lives in me. Then Philippians 1 and 20, he said, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, that Christ will be exalted in my body. Sin has messed it up, messed up our mind. But guess what? Paul said, I've got this new identity in Christ, so now I'm living in such a way that I want Christ to be exalted, not only just in my life, but in my death. You know what I think uh, Christians in America has got to learn how to do? We've got to learn how to die good. Hello? 
Now listen, I hope none of you die today, so don't practice on me right now. But I'm just telling you, we know it's appointed unto man wants to die. None of us in this room want disease. None of us in this room want sickness. None of us in this room wants our body to stop living. But according to the Bible, if Jesus doesn't come back, it's going to happen. What would happen to the people in your sphere of influence that you learn how to not only just live for Jesus, you was ready to die for Jesus? And you die in a good way. Well, that might be a Selah moment for some of you. Just stop and think for just a second, okay, God, I want to take my cue from you, not the world. And the world has a tendency when people start slipping out of this world, we want to grab everything in this world that we can get because we think we're going to take something with us. And the Bible says you come into this world naked and you're going to go out of this world naked. You're not going to take one thing with you. The only thing we can grab a hold of as we start leaving this world is more of Jesus and let him have more of us. That's the reason why before we had a medical world that started putting everybody to sleep before they died, you had so many saints that would testify that prior to their death, their hands went up, their songs started being singing, and they started worshiping God as they exited this world. It still happens in many foreign countries. In America, we don't want to deal with the physical part of dying because it's not pretty. But in parts of this world where they don't have the, the, the medical accommodations that we have in America, there are Christians that are still giving testimony of other believers that when they get ready to die, whether they have been killed, they've been shot, they've been stabbed, or they die of some, fitness, uh, some physical ailment, they see hands going up. Even when they can't utter the words out loud, they're seeing praises be the name of Jesus. They're saying, just like Stephen, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the... They're seeing great things in heaven because God's welcomed them home. Whoa, that's good preaching right there. Paul said, listen, I want to tell you, if I live my life for him, listen, I won't get crushed by failures or weaknesses. Nobody likes to fail, do we? No, nobody likes, everybody wants to succeed. But Paul said, when I'm living for him and not for myself, when I'm living for Jesus and not for anybody else, even when I have failures, they don't crush me. I come out victorious. I don't have despair and despondency. I try up in that. Listen, we, we, we won't get lost seeking the attractive but empty things of this world because Christ gives us the stability of this eternal hope that gives us the hope that enables us not just to live for him. Now listen, I'm praying every one of us live to Jesus. Come, okay? I don't like to do funerals. I'm praying. But listen, when the day comes, we go out victorious and triumph. Follow me? Why? Because we live to, for the audience of one. Here, here's a question I put in my notes. I didn't put it in yours. What are some of the choices that you can make right now to root your life in the identity of Christ that keeps you being fearful of dying? What are some choices you can make right now that can keep me fearful from dying? I'm not going after death. I'm not going to be stupid. Listen, I ride a motorcycle, but I, I, I'm as safe as I possibly can be. There's no, there's no evil Knievel in this man, okay? Just, just telling you, there's no evil Knievel. But to live our lives in such a way that when we face death, it doesn't make us afraid. It makes us say, listen, we've lived our life for the audience of one. So thirdly, real quickly, our identity in Christ causes us not to fear the future. Isaiah 26 and 3, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. Romans 8 and 15, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought you about your adoption to sonship. The adoption to sonship by him we cry, Abba, Father. You see that? 
We got this peace. Why? Because we fix our thoughts on him. We've been adopted in the sonship, and we can cry out, but Father, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give with you. I don't give this world. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. And then 2 Timothy 1 and 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear and t- timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. You know what that word timidity, I found out, the Greek, one of the Greek translations of that word timidity, you know what it means? It means to be neutered. <laughs> Woo. That's a scary thought for some young men around here. For others of us, we say no big thing. <laughs> Come on. He said, I didn't give you the spirit of timidity. I didn't give you a spirit that causes you to live in this broken world so that you are not able to produce a fruit of righteousness. Come on. I didn't give you a spirit of timidity. I didn't put you in this world so that you can no longer be fruit bearing. You're trusting in me. You put your hope in me. Your leaves will stay green. I don't care what wind blows. I don't care what storm comes. I don't care what drought happens. We stand and we keep producing in Christ Jesus. Why? That's where our identity is wrapped up in Him. We've been adopted. Oh, boy, that's a whole message. Pastor John could do so much better with that one. But I sat in the courtroom Friday. I seen a beautiful daughter and a beautiful son-in-law come together with their kids, adopting each other's kids, making their family one. You see, adoption is one of those unusual things that you choose. When, when a baby is born and birth, they hand them to you and you're, they're yours. You develop that love while you carry that child while the dad is there seeing the mom. But adopted family, they walk into a room. Sometimes it's a baby. Sometimes it's, a, it's an older child. And they say, I, I will now choose to love you. I will choose to accept you. I will choose you to bring you into my family. I've been amazed to see Pastor John and Kelsey and their step. And we've got others in this place that you've been foster parents and, and you stepped out of that world of brokenness for so many of these kids. And you said, listen, we want to bring those kids in our family. We want them to be loved by somebody. And we are willing. Listen, can I tell you, that's what God did for us. He adopted us. Listen, we wasn't lovable. We brought nothing to the table. We wasn't very desirable. But he said, I still choose to love you and adopt you into my family. Come on. Somebody give the Lord praise. It's amazing. I was seeing Pastor John and and Kelsey's children, how much just in the last few years, they look like them. They look like them. How does that happen? How does How does somebody from a total different DNA come in? It's because of the adoption power of love. Oh, Isaiah 41 and 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Don't be dismayed. I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with the righteousness of my right hand. Listen, here's what I know. Listen, if I have peace with God, then we have nothing to fear on this earth. You understand that? Our eternities are secure. We don't have to fear loss of job. Is it it fun to lose a job? No. We don't have to fear failing health. We don't want it to happen, but it does. I, I, I talk to guys. Listen, I deliberately hang around center people. I deliberately make a choice to carve out time in my life. Listen, I love the righteous people. I love you. But I don't spend the majority of my time with righteous people. I spend the majority of my time with knuckleheads and bikers and biker women and, and, and biker attitudes and, and carpenter attitudes and, and machinist attitudes. And listen, if you are a machinist and you are a carpenter, you know what kind of an attitude you can have. Well, listen, what, what I've discovered is that a lot of these guys, men and women, they're fearful about the future. They, don't, they have this uncertainty about tomorrow. And you and I have this opportunity. We can step in and we can say, listen, I know what it is to, have a, to lose a job. I know what it is to have a career to sidestep on me. I know what it is to have a, a wayward child. 
I know what it is to be ridiculed for my faith. None of those things are easy. None of those things are, are painless. None of them. I know what it is to have a child go wayward, step off the path. But what we have to decide is we're going to stop having the victimhood mindset. And we're going to speak back life. We're going to proclaim, my children will be saved. My children will not lie, die lost. My kids will go to heaven with me one day. I profess that. That's my victory speech. My grandkids. Listen, what, what we have to understand is we can have confidence in God that He'll equip us. Here's a, here's a challenging question right now. Just, just think about this. What challenges your confidence right now of trusting God for your future? What challenges are you having right now that you need God to give you victory over that, that's challenging you to trust God for your future? Pastor, you don't understand what my doctor said. You don't, you don't understand where my relationship is. You, you don't understand what my finances, what shape they're. You don't understand my job. It doesn't matter if I understand or not. What challenges are you facing right now that God says, I want you to trust me? When you have your identity in Christ, you will trust God. You will not fear the future. You will not live for yourself. You will live for God. Your identity is in Christ. It's something that you have received, not because you've achieved it. Number four, come on, Tino. Number four, our identity in Christ gives us no need to judge or compare ourselves to others. Listen to this last as we bring this thing together. How many understand? We talk about this a lot. Comparing and copying the two most discouraging things that we can do. When we live our lives and we try to go here because we don't have our identity in Christ, we're constantly comparing ourselves to somebody else's success, somebody else's family, somebody else's car, somebody else's house. So listen, when you're constantly comparing yourself, you will not have the peace of God. Or you copy after somebody else. Paul says this in Romans 14. He says, so why do we condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As the scripture says, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give our personal account to God. Wow. I don't compare myself to you or copy myself after you. Why? Because listen, I'm not going to stand before you. I'm not going to stand before this church or this board or my staff. I'm going to stand before God and so are you. Each one of us will give a personal account to God. Each one of us will give a personal account to God. Then he says, Galatians 6 and 4, he said, pay careful attention to your own work. For then you'll get satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. I'm going to give account to you, God. What do I need? To, I need to pay attention to my own work. Not what my brother's doing, not what my sister's doing, not what so and so. I'm just, what am I doing? And then I'll get satisfaction. And then he says in Galatians 1 and 10, For I now, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Did you get that? I want to tell you this. Listen, you cannot please God and please everybody around you. And if you get in the habit of trying to change yourself or change your vision or change your conviction because somebody's trying to move you over here, you won't please God. And when you stand before God, you, uh, well, well, the Lord, well, wait a minute, you know, my husband, he, he told me, my wife, my parents, no, doesn't matter, God says, you got to give an account for you. My dad and my mom have been faithful 
serving the Lord. I said it last week, 60, almost 66 years of ministry together. My dad worked in ministry. My mom has done that. But listen, I learned years ago that one day when I stand before God, Greg, I can't say, well, you know, Wallace E. Willingham, Benny Sue, they're my parents. Oh, you were born to them. Excuse me, God said. Come on in. Nope. Nope. How going to happen? We have to understand, listen, comparing ourselves to those around us or judging others is a dangerous place to be. Listen, there's nothing wrong with personal convictions. And listen, why we, we need personal conviction in our lives. But there's a difference between a belief about something and a conviction about something. Howard Hendricks said this. He said, a belief is something that you will argue about. A conviction is something that you will die for. Isn't it ironic today that we have people that have strong convictions over weak issues? You ever notice people get in a fight about which baseball team to root for in Chicago, the Cubs, and the oh, bless God, it's the White Sox. Is it the Bears or the Green Bay Packers? Is it, is it the Indianapolis Colts? Come on, you know, am I making sense? I mean, there are people, they, they, have, they, have, they have strong convictions on weak issues. But they have weak convictions, convictions on major issues. Oh, I don't want to get involved with that, Pastor Phil. I just, I just think that's a personal choice over there, and I just, I just want to stay clear of that. I don't want people to know where, where I stand. God knows in my heart. But you, I'm meddling, Ada. Come on, say God bless Pastor Phil's heart. He's meddling. Some of you will throw up the Cubs flag or the White Sox flag or the. Green Bay Packers flag. You don't care what neighbor care, what neighbor gripes about. You don't care. You got strong convictions about weak issues. How different would your life be if you had strong convictions about strong issues? This identity thing is important in our culture today. We have to be careful in the midst of that that we don't allow the enemy to cause that to drive a wedge. That we don't present Christ to people that are struggling because Satan has marred them. Satan has robbed them. Come on, I want you to stand. i got to quit. I want to close with this one last scripture. It's not in your notes. But Psalm 78, 70 said, He chose his servant David. He took him from the sheep pens. He, he brought him from feeding the hills that had lambs so that David would be the shepherd of the people of Jacob of Israel, the people who belong to the Lord. Now watch this. Here, here's what. With unselfish devotion, David become their shepherd. With skill, he guided them. Unselfish devotion. You see, what God does in our life sometimes, he starts where we're at. Some of us want to get way over here. And God said, will you serve and be faithful here in your identity? David was comfortable with his identity as a shepherd before he ever identified as a king. You follow me? Listen, we got people in this house that you got great dreams, great aspirations. You want to, you want to do something. And, I, and listen, I, I admire that. I love the entrepreneurship that we have going on in our church. I love that. Well, listen, why you, why you aspire to be something else and be something. Listen, don't miss the moment where God has you right now. This, this, this is the Holy Spirit speaking. It's not in my note. Don't miss the moment that God has you in right now. But some of you, it's the moment of being a parent. Raising a child, loving that child, letting that child grow up with a, with a fear and a love for God and understanding how much God loves them. For some of you right now, you're not yet moved into that place that God ultimately wants to take you. But God says, listen, just like David was unselfish devotion, he becomes the shepherd. Say, God, let me recognize the moment that I am. And let me help, enjoy, help me to enjoy this moment for this season. God's got greater things for a lot of people. We've got some young people in this house. God's anointing's on your life. Some of these young men, 
some of these young ladies, the anointing of God is on your life. But listen, stay in the moment of preparation. Stay in the moment of God working on your heart and your, your character. I'm speaking to some of you right now. Because then God can move you into that place. Because the problem we have in our culture today is that sometimes people's gifts take them where their character will not sustain them. The gift that God has put in their life moves them so fast they don't feel the character. So when they get to where they're at, they quickly tumble off the top. Satan won't always just keep you down. Sometimes he'll let you get to the top just to push you over. That's good preaching right there. Come on, this morning, I want us to get ready to close in prayer. Our identity is in Christ, is received, not achieved. It causes us to live for God, not for ourselves. It causes us not to fear the future. Our identity gives us no need to judge or compare ourselves to others. I, I don't know where you're at with this message today. I don't know what God is speaking to you. But I know there's some loss identities in this house today. And I know that there's some people here today, you know what God's called you to be, but you're not there yet. And God says, just keep trusting me. Stay faithful in your moment and walk with me. And God says, listen, I'm going to make sure I will award you. He will award your faithfulness. Amen. You believe that? I want you to bow your heads right before we pray. Holy Spirit, just fill this house right now. Come on, Faith, sing us a little bit of that song, would you? Come on, sing it, sing it, sing it, yes.